Hey guys, before we start today's episode, I just want to give a quick a highlight to a gentleman by the name of Patrick. Uh, this is not a brand deal. I'm not being paid to say this. Uh, it's just something I want to share with you guys, something that I actually truly believe in, especially when it comes to recording older consoles uh, with current day hardware, wherever you may be. So, Patrick has a company called HDRGB. It's kind of this one-man army with a couple of guys working with him, and um, he mods consoles. He mods Dreamcasts and Genesis and Nintendo and Famicom and all this stuff to essentially uh, output in a higher resolution. Uh, natively, older consoles have the ability to output in a 480p looking uh, scaling, and unfortunately in the States, most of our stuff was native. Whereas in Japan and in Europe, they had natively built in, but you had to get a certain kind of cable. And so what he does is he mods these consoles to output uh, in this true native nature with the cable out. And then you can get a converter and even upscale them to 720p and 1080p resolution. Now, why would you want this in today's day and age when you can just download everything to your virtual console? Well, not everything is available in the virtual console. And sometimes you actually just want to play with a actual controller. You want to play with an N64 controller. You want to experience it the way that you want to in nice definition on your television. So. I just wanted to give a big thank you to Patrick and his team who mod these consoles. I got one of these over at EGLX back in March, and uh, we recorded all of today's episode with this console. It lights up blue, it has an RGB out cable, uh, to output in SCART to a converter that does 720p and 1080, so it's really clean. I really believe in it. I think you guys should definitely give it a look. If you want to support Patrick and his team, go to hdrgb.com. Uh, or check him out on Instagram at HDRGB, as well as Twitter, HDRGB. Guys, go support them, support us, all that fun stuff. I hope you, do I hope you enjoy today's episode of Mario Kart. I think it turned out pretty good. Enjoy. We have Mario to thank for so much. He was there when Nintendo saved home consoles. He gave plumbers everywhere a dream to aspire to. He made overalls sexy. But most of all, he's been at the forefront of revolutionizing video game genres. Arguably the most famous of these is the racing genre with the Mario Kart series. Even the completely video game illiterate can enjoy a rousing race at a moment's notice. Mario Kart is truly the everyman game. Super Mario Kart may have kicked things off, but the Mario Kart we know today was really established in its second generation, which some consider to be the best Mario Kart of them all. Which is why today I'm completing Mario Kart 64. Hey everyone, and welcome back to another brand new episode of The Completionist. Today on the show, I'm doing something a little bit different. Sometimes you want to get on the open road and enjoy that air. Today, we're going to be completing Mario Kart 64, an all-time classic. So get ready, my friends. It's going to be an awesome damn time. Oh my god. Oh my god, I killed him. This is evidence. Turn the camera, turn the camera. I'm out, I'm out, I'm out. Yes! Right. Mario Kart 64 had a substantial impact on my gaming youth. I remember fights with my brother over characters. I remember the joy it brought me when I opened it up for the first time. I remember it frustrating me and pushing me into a new capacity for swearing. And it seems that every person even mildly interested in video games has at least one iteration of Mario Kart that became very special to them. In 1991, F-Zero was released for the Super Nintendo. And after successfully bringing blistering single-player racing to home consoles, Miyamoto looked to create the same feeling, but this time with multiplayer. The Nintendo developers were more than willing, but unfortunately, the tech within the Super Nintendo wasn't entirely able. To enable split screen, the tracks couldn't eat up as much processing power, and therefore couldn't be as sophisticated as their F-Zero inspiration. Despite that, they created Super Mario Kart, and it still went on to sell over 4 million copies. Fast forward to 1995, and the Nintendo 64 is about to be unleashed upon the American market, and lead directly to several cases of 
eye strain, childhood carpal tunnel, and countless nostalgia memes. Things were set for Mario Kart's follow-up to release as an N64 launch title, when suddenly, development resources were pulled and reallocated to a different title. Forgivably, that other game was Super Mario 64, and eventually, Mario Kart 64 dropped and became the second best-selling game for the console. Eventually, you were hard-pressed to find anyone who didn't have either Mario Kart 64 or GoldenEye at the ready for Quadra Player Mayhem that led to all sorts of little brother fist fights and ruined sleepovers. There's a special place in hell for all of you odd job users. Everything is on very high shelves. Mario Kart 64 harkens back to a time when you were forced to have real life physically tangible friends if you wanted multiplayer experiences. You know, instead of against some nine year old from across the country that has learned a surprising amount of hate speech. And thankfully, completing Mario 64 is pretty straightforward straightforward. I'll be focusing on the single player mode since there is really no concrete completion criteria in Versus. I'll be donning my cowboy hat and boots and walking this lonely road. The only road that I've ever known. Guys, Green Day is so hardcore! The Mario Grand Prix is where the majority of the completion process lies. It's essentially the rule of fours here. There are four difficulties. 50cc, 100cc, 150cc, and the unlockable extra mode. Each difficulty has four cups, Mushroom, Flower, Star, and Ringo. And in each of these are four tracks. My goal is to nab gold in each and add them into my digital trophy shelf where my digital dad can pretend to be digitally proud of me. All that remains is getting hella low times on certain tracks to be haunted by the staff ghosts. Essentially, the chance to race against the replay of someone on the development team. Man, this staff ghost thing is gonna be a creepypasta as soon as someone on the development team dies, I know it. I gotta be real, I am ready for a good old head down and march straight through kind of completion process right now. After doing Super Smash Bros. Melee recently, my desire for unlockables and extra modes is a bit... Uh, I can't even think of the word. My brain is still filled to the brim with bogus trophy requirements. Now, the only thing I'm really worried about when it comes to completing Mario Kart 64 are reopening those childhood wounds. I remember controller creaking frustration as red shells hit me right before finish lines. And no matter what I did, no matter how fast I furious, the rubber banding was there to hold me back. And like all the titles of this era, it still has to live up to the nostalgia built up for it over the last 20 odd years. Something that the N64, in my opinion, has a difficult time living up to. Since the shift to 3D was so major for the last console of the millennium, a lot of looks and features now feel incredibly dated. But it's so nostalgic! What could possibly go wrong? Oh, come on, those aged well! Sort of. Okay, maybe not. Mario Kart 64 is considered by many to be the best in the series. There is no denying that it is one of the best games for the Nintendo 64, but nostalgia is a powerful mistress. Is it the ultimate kart experience? I can't truly say it is. Time can be cruel. As far as premise goes, there isn't much to be said here. You know that time in elementary school when all of a sudden everybody was into yo-yos? Well, the same thing happened to the Mushroom Kingdom, except with small four-stroke engines. Everyone here has got themselves a go-kart, and now it's on like a West Virginia prom. The game really just ignores the whole context thing, which has become standard operating procedure for Mario's forays into other sports. Nintendo essentially takes Mario, puts him in a new uniform, keeps Bowser naked for some weird reason, and then says, eh, they do this now, enough said. Not to say they're being lazy, you don't need much of a narrative if the gameplay is strong. This is really the generation where you saw the Mushroom Kingdomites intermingle. Smash Brothers, Mario Party, and Mario Tennis were all around the corner. Mario Kart 64, as one of the earliest of these fan service games, has all of the ingredients, but it doesn't feel as full after all these years. I guess we've been spoiled by the wealth of quality pouring out of the fastest developing medium in human history. The N64 just didn't have all of its capabilities to 
discovered at that point, resulting in a game that feels a little underdone. To be real, visually speaking, Mario Kart 64 hasn't aged very well. In an interview, Hideki Kono said that at the time, having all eight racers on the screen at one time was costing so much of the processing power that full 3D modeled racers were impossible. That's how we got the pseudo 3D sprites on the characters, items, and even some of the obstacles. I kind of remember noticing this as a kid too. I caught that the characters just didn't seem to fit in. It's like I was about to go on a blind date and when she arrived, it turned out that she was a cardboard cutout. Now the date was still fun. We had a lovely pasta primavera, walked down the promenade, hung out with some of her work friends, but she just looked out of place. The basic sounds too kind of suffer from the limits of the N64. When Mario barks out the whoa, it sounds like he's in the other room with his head under a pillow. And has anyone to this day figured out what in the blue hell that noise is that Donkey Kong makes in this game? It sounds like someone is shaking a baby cow. <laughs> Don't worry about how I know that, that baby cow owed me money. Although this did turn me on to say my favorite Wario quote of all time. I'm a kind of wee. Weird. Uh, cool, so I'll see you at the park. Ah, I'm a kind of wee. Can you please just stop being a creep for once? Wah! I, I need you to stop Wah! being a creep. I'm not gonna wee. I'm not gonna wee. You're gonna wee. <laughs> Grow up, Gerard. And that's where my criticisms end. The levels themselves are vibrant and well-stocked with enough personality to keep my eyeballs interested. Moo Moo Farm and Luigi Raceway may be simple, but the colors are so intoxicating. And although some of the sounds may be less than optimal, the music is top of the heap. It's some of the best to come out of the Mario series. From the title sequence all the way to Rainbow Road, I never stopped humming along and bobbing my head in childish glee. The game establishes a poppy jazz motif with each course having its own distinguishable theme. And each one is killer. Luigi Raceway gets me pumped, Koopa Troopa Beach makes me want a pina colada, and Rainbow Road's theme makes me want to run through a meadow completely naked, just accepting myself. Mario Kart 64's presentation overall may have some fraying at the edges, but it still feels good to come back to play after all of these years. It has some performance issues during four player split screen, and speedrunners have ripped every hole imaginable into the lap detection of the game. But on the whole, it's still a tight package. Now, I'm not exactly what you would call a car guy, but I know that, despite a little rust, Mario Kart still has plenty move juice in the old gas hole. I know I kind of railed on the looks, but the game still has a lot of beauty under the hood. That being said, drive any car for long enough and things are bound to wear down. How tight the gameplay is and my capacity to improve determine how tasking the completion process is. I was happy to once again wrap my hands around that freakish controller and get back to my childhood days of tossing turtle shells and drifting mad asphalt. As always, Nintendo stays true to tradition and keeps the controls basic. Mario Kart 64 introduces plenty of mainstay mechanics to the series. Jumping and drifting had always been a part of the kart series, but it was in its second iteration when we would be introduced to the drift boost. Learning everything is simple, and once you get it down, you really feel in control of some less than typical handling. The characters are few, but they're all that you need, as the primary stars of the Mario series are all represented. And Wario 2, who begs a good question. Who is your Wario? Mine is either Zach Galifianakis or Fat Free Ice Cream. I found Yoshi to be the most useful at handling and quickness, but it was fun to dust off Bowser and just throw my weight around as I knock people out of the way of my home turf. Get out of my castle, son. You don't want none of this shit. 
The 16 levels benefit from the move to 3D with the ability to change altitude on the course. I don't know if you remember Super Mario Kart on the SNES, but there were no hills or valleys, and all of the jumps were vague yellow bumps instead of ramps. And if you have yellow bumps, you don't have a race course. You have a throat infection. I looked it up. The change in depth allowed for a much more unique feel from course to course. This is where Mario Kart became the game we know and love. Now, completing racing games is like a a double-edged sword. I mean, repetition is the focus of the game. You have to race each course over and over again until you master it. Therefore, there's always a sense of progression. But when it boils down to shaving off milliseconds, the tracks must be incredible to hold my attention. And for the most part, these did. But Toad's Turnpike can go f itself. I mean, why are those trucks driving on the go-kart courses in the first place? And I never remembered Yoshi's level name because I called it Yoshi's Cliff Bastard ever since I first played it. But levels like Wario Stadium and Rainbow Road will never get old for me. After all of these years, the controls did take some time getting used to, but they were never made with the intent of feeling like a go-kart. Controlling a go-kart is much more about cornering. If you try drifting in real life, you would spin out more than the DJ at your cousin's bar mid so the sliding touchy controls of Mario Kart 64 are all a part of the intended experience. All of the goodies are back from the original game. The shells, the bananas, the lightning bolt for shrinky dinks. Though it was in Mario Kart 64 where they introduced the fake box, the triple items, the golden mushroom, and yes, the meme machine, the ever vigilant manhunter, fast pass to being the biggest ass in the world, the spiny shell, more commonly known as the blue shell. Luckily, since I was mostly playing single player, the game took pity and didn't throw as many of them at me as I remembered from my youth. Hey, oh, do you hear that? That sounds like a royalty-free cover of the Spinner song, Rubber Band Man. Why? Because he's here, in all of his restrictive glory. Yes, in single player, no matter what you do, the game decides on two jerks that are always going to be on your ass. I understand how it's supposed to increase the amount of tension in a race instead of just letting the enemies get blown out of the water. The only issue with it is that this can lead to some pretty gut-wrenching final moments during a race, and not in that cool, end of a kick-ass action movie kind of way. But more like a, oh, they just killed the main character because their contract negotiations did not work out out sort of thing. While Mario Kart 64's single player mode is maybe a little underdeveloped, it kept me more than entertained throughout its duration. Nabbing gold in all three modes and then unlocking an extra mode was pretty breezy. I wish I could say the tale ended there, with a happy little kiss or something. Unfortunately, what waited for me were three course time trials in Luigi Raceway, Mario Raceway, and the Royal Raceway, achieving certain times will unlock the Staff Ghosts, a replay of one of the members from the development team beating the level. At first look, the requirement seemed innocuous enough at a minute 52, a minute 30, and two minutes and 45 seconds respectively. I could not have been more deceived. Unlocking these took a monumental amount of repetition, research, and trial and error. Despite my love for the raceway courses, I was ready to break up with them. And not I mean in a brutal way, like at the altar or on the Jumbotron. I found myself screaming, this feels like padding! But for the love of Genova, after 20 goddamn hours and countless laps, I f***ing did it. May my aching thumbs enjoy their place in Valhalla come Ragnarok. In the end, Mario Kart 64 may not be the prettiest person at the ball, but they can still groove. I'm almost ashamed to say that the aesthetics wore on me so much since I had a great time playing. The money sounds don't change the fact that it's paired with the kick-ass soundtrack. The pixelated characters are still cradled in excellent level design, and the cheap rubber banding effect is only a minor blemish on tight and addictive gameplay. It almost makes me want to go out and jump inside of a Mario Kart myself, but I'm so fragile that... ah. Yeah, yeah, I hurt my ankle just thinking about buying one. After that giant cheap cheap barfed up my last trophy and all the time trials were beaten, my journey was essentially over. And the lack of resources for this game is shown in spades by its unlockables. And by unlockables, I mean unlockable. One, by getting first place in all the Grand Prix in the game, you are rewarded with, drum roll please, a different title screen. Whoopee! 30 hours of work and I get a brand new cover for my Trapper Keeper. It's like going through four years of college and all I got to show for it was a, 
a piece of paper. I guess you could consider the Staff Ghost Trials unlockables as well, but after you get them, there isn't much you can do other than, well, try and do what you were doing before, which was getting a better time on the course. After that, there's nothing left for your single player heart to achieve. It's best to move on to getting real friends and playing on the multiplayer split screen. You can also check out the battle mode with its four levels of varying murderousness, but I always found the fun of battle mode to be pretty short-lived, and somehow I was Always stuck with a goddamn banana peel. What am I, desperate for laughs in the 1920s? If you're looking for an additional challenge, might I recommend getting fourth in every race of a cup. When you finish, you will see the only narrative cutscene in the game. You're a lonely character who watches the top three contenders go to their glory and is left behind to drive off the hill like a lonely cowboy. That is, until a bomb comes to ace your ass right after you get to your moment of noble defeat. Ain't life a bitch. If that wasn't strange enough, Enough, then go ahead and check out the league of unintentional shortcuts that speedrunners have found throughout the game. But beyond your own machinations, you're not going to find anything else waiting for you. No 100% bonuses, no extra characters, and no additional courses. That's never what the game was about in the first place though. It wasn't about a full-fledged single-player mode. It was about the multiplayer effect with which there were another 100 plus hours of gameplay available to you. Completing this game top to bottom was extended and arduous, but completely surmounted by my callous completionist fingers. The single player campaign can almost be done in one playthrough barring any tragic RNG. And the ghost trials, while difficult, can be done on the right day with the right mix of caffeine and ramen. While I completed Mario Kart 64, there were three ghost trials unlocked, 64 Grand Prix races won, 523 time trial attempts, attempts damn it, 30 hours of total playtime, and six times I hugged people in the office and whispered, I'm a gonna ween. Frazier almost quit. <laughs> So there you have it, Mario Kart 64. In my opinion, age has not been too kind to this one. At the end of the day, it is a pretty straightforward game to complete, but it kind of has a little bit of rust on it. I think every game after Mario Kart 64 is incredible. Double Dash, even the Nintendo DS version of Mario Kart. Unfortunately, while it isn't as good as it could be, at least it set the precedence for what Mario Kart should be going forward. So, with that in mind, guys, I give this game my completionist rating of finish it. Oh, hey, my wallet. Finish it. <sighs> That's all time for today, guys. So please, as always, let me know about today's episode somewhere on the internet. If you like what you saw, hit that like button. Subscribe. Let me know what future episodes of the show you want to see here on The Completionist. A big shout out to HDRGB, guys. If you want to go check him out in his business, please, please, please go do so. Him and his team are awesome. They've been real supportive of us. Uh, this Mario Kart episode was made possible because of them, so go check him out. And if you want to see more HD goodness, you can check out our episode on Beer Bros. We did with the, with the tech. I'll see you next week after I figure out what to do with Bradley's body. Like, I know it's buried, but... I hope someone finds it.